Now, although computers are quite happy with numbers, we would prefer abc.net.au instead of having to remember 203.2.218.214. So thankfully, there's a system for matching names and numbers. This is called the domain name system, or DNS. Computer people like abbreviations, have you noticed? Now, you'll have this system at your school, but it's far more useful for outside addresses. So if I'm on machine one at my school and I want to go to Minecraft, I don't know where it is. So I ask my router who looks it up in its DNS table and sends the packet to the right address. If it doesn't have the Minecraft address already, it will ask the next router in the chain, which will ask the next one until a master server is reached if needed. And there are several root servers, as they're referred to, which hold the data or how to get the data for every router in the world. So back to Jeannie. When she wants to do some Minecraft, as we've seen, we've got all these connections that need to hook together. And we finally get to the Minecraft server. Here you can see that she's using a shared network because she's on wireless and therefore her packet of information has to have a to and from address. The to address is outside the network that she's on, so the router sends it out further, probably going to an internet service provider, which then knows how to reach the Minecraft server. It knows the number for the Minecraft server and goes to complete the connection. And she gets to use Minecraft. At school, it's pretty much exactly the same thing. The only difference is that you'll have more devices on that shared network and you'll have that firewall in the road which either enables you to go somewhere or in the case of Bill, who's Jono's mate, will stop you from going to somewhere that is decided to be inappropriate by the organisation. So let's get back to the internet as a network connecting the entire world. These are just the connections under the sea. There are more over land and via satellite, but each connection can represent a single point of failure. And this is important. It could be overloaded, it could malfunction, or it could break. So that single point of failure might mean that if there's only one and it fails, we lose all connectivity. So for reliability, the internet uses the idea of redundancy. For every sender and receiver, there are multiple paths in the same way that we can drive from Brisbane to Sydney via the coast, or we could use an inland route. So if the coast road is flooded or perhaps it has a huge traffic jam, we can detour via one of the inland routes. So let's look at an example using Google Maps. Imagine I'm staying at the Sheraton Hotel. Hmm, that's interesting. Imagine I'm staying at the Sheraton Hotel in Chicago and I have a meeting at Trump Tower. Now, even though the radio that I'm listening to tells me that there are traffic jams on the Blue Route, Google Maps has calculated that it's quicker at this time to take that route. Now, this is called least cost routing and the cost here is time. On the internet, routing costs can change due to breakages or simply lots of people watching a streamed live sporting event. And if not well managed, that can result in lagging or buffering, which isn't good for watching a video or playing an action game. So I would choose to go via the blue route. That's the least cost to me when time is being measured. It's only four minutes compared to five. Now that may not seem a huge difference, but when we're looking at a video, 
that difference is effectively a 20 minute advantage a 20 percent advantage that difference is a 20 percent advantage over going on one of the other routes and my partner who was finishing his coffee leaves 10 minutes later than me and by this stage the traffic on the blue route may have changed so Google Maps may indicate that another route is now the fastest. Now that's the job of a router is not just to decide where packets go, but also to decide the most efficient route for them to travel. So we saw how data was sent on a simple local area network connection. The source, the destination, what I want to send and an error check. And it's called an Ethernet frame. But on the internet, it's a tad more complex. So this requires a different protocol. And this is the Transmission Control Protocol, or TCP, which is part of the transport layer of computer networks. As the name would suggest, TCP controls the transport of data through the various routers. The information that we need to send looks like this. Now each colour in this diagram represents a 32-bit computer word, uses 32 bits of information. The source address is the IP address of the sending computer and similarly the destination address is the IP address of the receiving computer. Now because of least cost routing and the fact that some packets may take longer than others to get from the sender to the receiver, the packets might not arrive in the right order. So the computer needs to know which packet of data is which so that they can be assembled in the right order. TCP also has a thing called an acknowledge and it's pretty much the same as the acknowledge bit in the printer protocol seen in an earlier video. It's part of the acknowledgement process which provides accuracy in the transmission of data but this comes at the cost of time. TCP packets take longer to send because we use the ACK process, the acknowledge process. Then you've got a bunch of things called flags, which are either on or off indicators, like a flag being up or down, to control flow or reset or terminate the connection, and a few other more complex functions that are out of the scope of this video. We have a thing called a window size, which tells the receiving computer how big the message is in bytes, which is handy to check accuracy. And you've got a thing called a checksum, which is a little bit more complex version of what we saw in the printer communication video earlier. And then you've got a thing called an urgent pointer, which tells the receiver that some data is required more urgently than others. Now it's up to the application on the receiving device to decide what to do with that information. And then finally, after some options, which we won't go into at the moment, and some padding, so it all turns out to be 32 bits, we get the data itself. And that data can be a variety of different lengths depending upon the method of transmission. So, reasonably complex, but everything seems to make sense, I think. And one of the really cool things that the architects of the internet has done, have done, one of the really cool things that the architects of the internet have done is to separate the different layers of communication, like the way that a business has a CEO who tells the managers what the board wants to happen and then the managers tell the general staff what to do so that the company's goals can be achieved. So what we've looked at are these layers. We've looked at a thing called the link layer, which manages the reliable transfer of data between two devices. Mostly we use internet, uh, Ethernet now, either hardwired or switched, or we use a shared wireless system we know as Wi-Fi. The network layer handles addressing, routing and traffic control in a network with multiple devices using address resolution protocol and internet protocol. An IP talks to the next layer, which is called the transport layer, which makes sure that messages get sent through by breaking them up into packets. It sends them 
reconstructing the original message from the packets of information. And then finally, the application layer uses further specific protocols to handle web traffic using the hypertext transfer protocol, handling mail using the simple mail transfer protocol, and file transfer using a thing called the file transfer protocol. These protocols are outside the scope of this discussion, but just leave it that these have agreed ways of handling data and what they're going to do with it. Now, there is another protocol in the transport layer, which is called the user datagram protocol, or UDP. Now, it's a sort of a TCP light. It has a less sophisticated error checking, and it doesn't have any acknowledgement of packets received. So you don't know if everything you've sent has arrived. There's an old saying that says, I'd tell you a joke about UDP, but I'm afraid you wouldn't get it. The advantage is that UDP is consequently a lot faster with less lag. So it's useful for voice over IP or VoIP, streamed video where adopt, a, a dropped packet of information may be tolerated. You'd see this as a brief glitch on your screen. And it's also used for very short messages such as domain name systems or a DNS request give me the address for abc.net.au, just a short bunch of numbers being sent back, or a dynamic host configuration protocol, the DCP HCP request says, give me an IP address. So, to summarise... Computer communications are based on what we've learnt from earlier communications, such as Morse code and talking to teletypes and printers. It's a continually evolving process. The common factors are the use of binary, the need for a receiver and a sender to be identified when more than two devices are involved, the recognition that errors can occur due to electrical glitches, the ways that our errors are identified and corrected, the acknowledgement of correctly received data and a send again mechanism for corrupted data. And when the internet is involved, we have to do more. We have to work out the best route for data. And as this may change from time to time, a way of recognizing the order of received packets and a way of reconstructing the original order. We need devices called routers to figure out the best least cost routes and a system of relating human useful addresses such as abc.net.au and computer useful numbers such as 203.2.218.214. Now routers talk to other routers using yet another protocol, there's a lot of them, called Internet Control Message Protocol or ICMP to establish what routes are currently best or which ones have problems. Now, commuter communications is a bit of a rabbit hole. The more you dig into mechanisms of transmission and receiving, the more you realise that the work of the humans who've made all this happen is one of the most amazing works that the human race has accomplished. The fact that the management of the internet is not controlled by a single government or a single for-profit corporation is additionally amazing. I encourage you to go out with this new knowledge and with this new vocabulary to do further searching to go down that rabbit hole further.